count him down for? Oh, hey, Mike is live. Wow. Awesome. Right on. He's got a timer too. Hey guys, welcome to my session. Uh, let's see if the clicker decides to start working, because it was just working a second ago. Lost the practical technician. Um, before we get started, thank you. I just need one. Um, if people who are here, can I get a show of hands? How many of you are actually technical people? Awesome. How many of you are responsible for training other technicians? Great. This show, or session, <laughs> is designed to teach you how to teach your technical people. But if you are technical and not necessarily responsible for training, you'll get something out of it as well. And the content of this session is not exactly technical. It's geared towards the mindset and thinking. So just keep that in mind. If you're not technical, this will still be helpful to you, especially if you are responsible for training other technicians under you. Um, I like to go off script a lot, but I do refer back to my notes. So oftentimes I'll be looking down the read to see what I'm supposed to be talking about, uh, like right now. First of all, I want to like talk about what these laws actually are. Where do they come from? Right? Who am I and why do they exist? I'm Mendy Green. I am the founder of Rising Tide Consulting Group, current CEO of MSP Geek. Uh, I was at an MSP for 13 uh, or so years, 13, 14 years. It's under debate, depending on when I left, something like that. Uh, of which 10 or so, I was the lead technician, trainer, CTO for quite a while. And there were constant things that I would rant at people. Like when the technician comes to me with a question, I would ask the same thing over and over again to that technician. For those of you who are escalation people, like you know what I'm talking about when they come to you for something. And I would just feel like I'm ranting at them. And when I left the MSP, I realized that like suddenly I had time to sleep. And I woke up one day and I was able to realize like I can write this stuff down. So I wrote an article which I decided to turn into a session when ConnectWise asked me to do a talk. What? Take a picture of the slide, according to the peanut gallery. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is the agenda. This is going to be what we're talking about today. These are the six laws. Um, they're also available online, uh, which you can get to. And obviously, the slides will be available uh, from when, when I upload them, because they're not currently <laughs> uploaded. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about MSP Geek. I did say I was current CEO and MSP Geek Con. Uh, MSP Geek Con is a conference. It's an educational conference geared towards training your technicians. And essentially, the content of that conference is basically two days of what I'm going to try to compress into these 45 minutes that I have with you right now. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to be offering a raffle. I'm raffling off a full ride to MSP Geek Con. It does not include travel, just ticket and accommodations. Uh, if people, I want you to basically fill the raffle in right now. We're going to take a minute. If you can go to this website on the slide and submit your name and just raise your hand when you've done it, please. Let me know if you have any issues. Has anyone been able to pull up the site at this point? 404. Did you do ITN Connect at the end? Anyone else get the site? You can't submit? Yeah? OK. What if I tell you that the first person who can get their name submitted wins that prize? As a spoiler alert, the website was designed to be broken. And what we're talking about here is the technician mindset. Well, we, what I just demonstrated to you is the difference between the user mindset and the technician mindset. When you have a problem that you, on something you expect to work, you run into a roadblock. You get stuck. I need help. I can't fix it. I don't know what's going on. Can someone please assist? Right? And this is something that you notice with your tier one technicians, or even yourself sometimes, or your customers. When they run into a problem, they should have the capacity to fix themselves. 
and they just don't, it's because of the mindset, the context that they're running in is the user mindset as opposed to the technician mindset. The website, there is a way to make it work, by the way. If you want to try to make it work after the talk and get your name submitted and come to me, the prize still does exist. Uh, but please don't do it right now, because I want you to pay attention the rest of this, of this session. Uh, but the idea is that you, when you have a problem, you want to keep an open mindset um, to make sure that you're approaching it with a problem-solving approach. All right, so there are a couple of things that we want to do. Well, number one is we expect issues. If you expect things to work and then it doesn't work, you get stuck. If you expect problems, you already know how to handle it when it comes up. You may not know how to fix every single problem, but you're expecting a problem, and so then you're already geared towards solving that challenge when it happens. I had something else I wanted to say, but I can't remember it <laughs> uh, right now. But let's move on. Uh, problem solving approach, right? It's pretty much the same thing that we just talked about. We want to make sure that we're seeing the problem as a challenge to, to solve as opposed to a roadblock that gets in your way. And then, of course, the context matters. What I just demonstrated for you, uh, which, by the way, took way too long to think of than it should have, uh, trying to find that way to demonstrate the context between the user mindset and the technician mindset, right? That's, this is what we're talking about. The user mindset puts you in a frame, set, a frame of mind where it makes it difficult to solve the problem, where the technician mindset sets you up for um, something to, to, to go wrong and for you to be able to fix it. Actually, I just remembered what I wanted to talk about. I, as a technician, I get asked questions all the time, obviously, right? And for me, the response that I engage in because of the amount of my habits and behavior is completely different than what you'd normally expect. So whether it's a friend, a family member, or someone at work comes to me and says, hey, Mendy, I'm experiencing this weird issue. The internet's not working. Or a weird thing is going on. X, Y, Z is broken. My response to that is, that's not weird. If you had any idea what it would take for the internet to actually work, the level, the deck of cards, the house of cards that has to exist for everything to align perfectly for the internet to actually work, what's weird is that it works at all, right? So like what we need to do is figure out which part of the house is now broken so we can identify why it's not working this time and then get it working again, right? It's not weird that it's not working. It's weird that it even worked in the first place. It's a completely different shift in mindset, right? We expect the problem and we approach it with a problem solving challenge. The thing that we want to do, going back to the context of teaching our technicians for a minute, right, is we want to make sure we specifically structure questions to set your mind specifically. Right? It's, it's very easy to fall into the user mindset. It's very easy to expect things to work. Um, have you ever heard of the five laws of cybersecurity uh, by Nick Espinoza? One of the things that he says, one of those laws, is humans trust even when they shouldn't. Right? This is a problem. I don't know if it's a problem. Maybe it's a good thing that we have where we trust things to just work. We trust things to just happen. We see someone, we make a connection, we trust them, and so on and so forth. He has a different context for it, but in this case, it's the same exact thing. We expect technology to work because we see it working every single day and we interact with it every single day, right? So it's very easy to fall into the user mindset and just, I got up here and said, submit your ticket, submit your raffle, and we'll go ahead and raffle it off, and everyone went ahead and tried. It's supposed to work, right? And then suddenly I turned into a challenge, and now your, your entire mindset shifted. It's using the question to set the mind, right? I don't know if you can read that small text up there, but basically when we're talking and teaching your technicians, we want to make sure that you can demonstrate the mindset, the user mindset versus the technical mindset, so they can understand the difference and recognize it themselves, right? The next law that we talk about is reading the entire screen. Uh, this is something that I would, I would, when I say rant, I mean I would literally rant at someone. Uh, people who worked with me at my MSP, can vouch for that. There's a couple, or there's one person here, uh, another one who works with me today. Um, it's something that we see all the time, right? If you're, if you're le leaning over the shoulder of your technician and they're doing something because they're asking you for help and they see an error message, what's their first reaction, right? They click through it. Have they read it? Do they know what it says? Did they even bought, like they're feeling pressure because you're over their shoulder? And so they're just like, oh, sorry, that came up, like click through it. And you're like, what, whoa, what, what did that say? Oh, I don't know. Well, then how do you expect to fix it, right, if you don't know what it says? Pay attention to what's being done, what the user is doing. Pay attention to what the screen is telling you, because everything it, it, does, it does and says matters. 
Um, here's a point that, that I actually also drill in, um, although not normally in as much, in as, with as much detail. Uh, but generally speaking, if there is a software that's in use in the general public, it's in use because it's successful, right? You don't have successful software if the interface doesn't make sense or is difficult to use. That's the idea. Obviously, there's a very wide scale <laughs> of what that could mean. But for the most part, within the context of the person's job, the user's job, not your job, the context of the user's job, the software makes sense to them, which is why that user is using it, right? And so from that perspective, in order for the software to make money, it has to make sense, it has to be usable. All that you have to do as a technician is read the screen, explore the software, find out the context it's being used as, understand the terminology, right? Talk to the user, the user will tell you what it is they normally do, how things are supposed to happen or not happen, right? And then you, the technician, with, with the technician mindset, will figure out what's missing and, move, and fix it from there, right? I have some other small text on there that says, um, oh, this is a great example, right? If I were to tell everyone to stand up, close your eyes, and walk around the room, how many of you would do it? Yeah, you would, okay. <laughs> One person. <laughs> Uh, right, but like generally speaking, you're like, what do you, why, why would I do that? I don't want to walk into a chair or a wall or somebody else, right? But if I tell everyone to stand up, look around, and take one step to an available space, suddenly you all have no problem doing it, generally speaking, except for the troublemakers who are like, well, why? Why should I do that, right? But the point is, is that you're not going to go somewhere if you can't see where you're going. And if, if you can't read, if you're not reading the screen, you're not reading the error message, you're not understanding what it is that's going on or what they're doing. Why are you even trying to fix something when you don't understand what's happening? Understand the problem, right? So we need to understand the problem. I forgot to fix this typo, uh, which is funny. This is meant to say, understand the problem at least as well as the person asking you for help. I have this wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't, I didn't fix it, even though I was specifically asked if I fixed it, and I said, yeah, sure, right? Uh, no, this was not fixed. We want to make sure that we understand the problem at least as well as the person asking you for help, right? Because there's no way that you can fix it if you don't understand what's going on. As an escalation engineer, how many of you have had a technician under you come to you and say, hey, I have this problem here and here, and you say, well, what's going on? They go, I don't really know. Or, or did you, what's the error message say? I don't really know. Well, have you tried this? Well, I haven't really done that. Right? Or they, they'll come to you like, the user is complaining that they can't open this thing. What is it? No idea. Like, why would you even come to me to ask, right? They should be understanding the problem as, at least as well as the original user who asked for it, right? Another common scenario that we see with technical support is that the user that we think is the user calls in and says, hey, uh, this happens. I had, we did nursing homes at the MSP. This happened a lot for us. Client calls in, internet's down on wing B, or something like that. And they go, oh, that's weird. We didn't get any alerts. We look in it, everything's fine. What's going on? I don't know. Internet's down on wing B. And so we're going back and forth. And then we finally get them, like, what is happening? Well, I'm not the one actually experiencing the issue, right? But they've reported over here. And then suddenly, you're talking to a whole other person. And they go, yeah, it's just this one computer that's offline, right? If you're not talking to the person who understands the problem, right, then you're not going to get anywhere. And so you, as a technician, have to understand it at least as well as the person asking you for help, not the person you're asking for, right? That's wrong. <laughs> Solve for why. This is a, a term I, I'm still getting used to the phrase, but it's the, the Mendy algebraic method. <laughs> we solve for why, W-H-Y, not the letter Y, right? Because when someone comes to you with a problem, you need to understand it. You need to understand why, they're, why it's a problem. You know, why does this even exist? Why do you think it's supposed to work? One of my common things that I like to use is an example of a, of a program not opening, right? Um, going back to my example before, like why, it's not weird that it works, or that it doesn't work. It's weird that it even works in the first place, right? If you approach with that mindset, and the example that I give, someone calls and says, hey, my program's not running. I don't know what's going on. It worked yesterday. My answer isn't, oh, that's weird. My answer is, well, why do you even expect it to work in the first place, right? And so then we log in and say, look, well, show me what you're doing. Like, why do you think it should work? 
And they go, well, I have this shortcut here on this desktop. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, now we know where it's come. Okay, sure, let's look at the shortcut. Why do you think that's supposed to even do anything? And we open up the properties of that shortcut and we see it's pointing to a path. It's like, okay, fine. So now we're, we're following the chain back to understand why it should even open in the first place. And they go look for that path and it's gone. Well, now we know why it doesn't work, right? So if you reverse the question from it's broken to why should it even work, it allows you to explore the essentially um, the, six, the, the dependency chain. I've renamed this a couple times. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, I'm actually ahead of myself. Yeah. But we, ba <laughs> we basically want to, we'll, we'll come back to that. We want to recreate the problem first, right? And we want to understand the impact, going back to the idea of, of understanding what's going on. And we want to um, make sure we gather information around what's happening. Like, w it, it goes back to the point of being able to recreate the problem. Right? We want to make sure that if I hang up with you, the user, and I need to recreate this issue myself, because I'm going to be going either figuring it out or talking to the next person in line, then I need to make sure I can recreate the problem without getting you back involved. Right? So that's what your technician should be doing. And then we prepare for escalation. Right? The same questions, oftentimes people don't even think about it until they go and talk to you as an escalation point. And then you go back and say, well, what was the error? Well, what did you try? Where are the screenshots? Right? These questions, they should already be thinking about from, ste from step one. Because not only do you need it, if they have to escalate it, if they want to work on the issue, they have to know it too. <laughs> it's the same exact, the, the reason why you're asking the questions is not because you have some secret sauce that only you can do, it's because these are the questions you need in order to solve the problem. Whether or not you're that person, or the next person, or the next person, it doesn't make a difference. And so if you train them to start thinking about escalation from the beginning, collecting those answers from the beginning, it's going to improve their ability to even think about the problem to start solving it for themselves. Be intentional about your troubleshooting. Closing your eyes and throwing darts at the wall is not helpful. If you want, there's a game room with a dartboard. You can go try it. It doesn't work. Uh, you may put someone's eye out. It's not on me. There's a disclaimer. Um, but basically, this goes back to the point of understanding the issue, reading the screen, right? Being intentional when you're troubleshooting. Do not guess at what the issue is. You want to make sure that whatever you're doing, there is a level of guess and check, but whatever you're doing is related to the item specifically uh, linked to the actual issue, right? And so a lot of people, a lot of things that drive me nuts, I talk to support about a database connectivity issue, and they go, well, maybe it's DNS, right? And I've, and I've just showed them that I can resolve the name to the IP address. And they go, maybe it's DNS. Like, do you know how networking works? That's not, that's not DNS, because I already have the IP address, right? So as long as you, and they go, well, maybe we should just flush the cache and try it again. Like, no, no, that's not related. We've already confirmed that re the name resolves correctly. We want to make sure that the troubleshooting that we do is directly related to the area of wherever the issue is, right? And then finally, we have here what I was talking about before, mapping out what we call the dependency chain. Everything we just talked about has, every, we just talked about the other uh, a moment ago, that everything is a house of cards, right? Some, there are things that rely on other things to make it work, which is why it's amazing that the internet works, or that Wi-Fi works, or things like that, right? And so if we understand the dependency chain, everything that exists in the chain in order to make this work, then we know we can find where the point is broken, where the chain is broken. And from there, we can start figuring out why that's broken and solving that specific issue. Right? It goes back to intentional troubleshooting. It goes back to understanding the problem. When we start asking the negative, the reverse why, then we can understand how it's supposed to work in the first place, which helps us build out that dependency chain. Progress is progress, both good and bad, right? If we make any kind of dent, whether it's forward or backward, that means we're in the right area, right? If you have a problem with your computer not turning on and you go flip a light switch and the computer doesn't do anything, like power is still being provided and nothing changes, then you're flipping the light switch hasn't made a dent, right? But if you have a problem with your computer that you think is power related, and you flip a switch and the power turns off, you now know that somewhere in this dependency chain, power is being provided to you from that switch and that it is included in that chain. So whether or not it's bad progress or good progress, it's helping you map out that dependency chain. And evaluate and adjust. This is uh, most commonly overlooked. 
right? Uh, people are like, well, let's see. Uh, historically speaking, we've seen this issue when this thing has happened, so we're just going to try to fix it with this register key and see what happens without any kind of evaluation to determine whether or not it's even the same issue, right? The amount of different symptoms that can appear to be the same problem that show up is immeasurable. <laughs> I was looking for a good word. Uh, but, you know, the, and, and, and oftentimes people rely on their history and what they've, what they've seen in the past as opposed to looking at what the actual problem is, right? At MSP Geekon, going back to that for a moment, in year one, our very first topic on the, key, on the keynote stage was beginner's mind. When we, we, when we approach a problem, we need to make sure that we're not assuming anything about this problem. We can use our assumed knowledge and our historical whatever experience and so on and so forth when we find the actual issue to fix that issue. But when someone calls in to report that their cursor is blinking too fast, when they scroll, it scrolls four pages at a time, all their pages are being minimized every minute, or their mouse is going erratic, we don't know what the problem is. All we see is the outcome. And so we need to understand what's going on first, and then when we know the problem, we can then rely on our experience to go fix it. Question assumptions. Everything you think you know and are being told, right? Um, assumptions are, are the root of all evil, or something like that, right? That's, there's a less nice way of saying that, but uh, assumptions are bad. And at the same time, we tell you in order for you to actually do any kind of troubleshooting and fixing, you kind of have to make some assumptions. But what we should be doing is all the assumptions that we have should be weighted in terms of uh, likely to be truth, right? And what we do is when we are provided with evidence to the contrary of our assumption, we have to make sure we can account for that to say, do I really know what's going on or do I have to go back and check it again? Expect to be wrong all the time, right? Uh, this is something that's going to be helpful because, number one, it's going to help you question everything you think you know. Like, do I really know this? Is that really how it works? We go look it up. Oh, yeah, I'm right. Or, better yet, instead of looking it up, if there's a way to test it, you can desi design a test to run through to actually tell you if what you expect to happen is happening or not. Right? If you expect to be wrong all the time, it helps you solve for that. The other thing it helps you do is it prevents some sort of bias that occurs. Oftentimes, you may run into a situation where you get um, you think you know something because of past experience, and you just assume automatically that's what it is, and you ignore everything else. If you're expecting to be wrong all the time, instead of going, oh yeah, it's probably this because I've had it before, you're going to go, I wonder if it's this. Probably not, but let's find out. And suddenly it's a different mindset that's coming into play that's allowing you to test for whether or not it is the same situation instead of just blatantly trying it or, or blanketly trying it and then getting it wrong, right? Seek out information. Ask yourself for help first, right? We just talked about in the very first few slides that context matters and that um, <laughs> it, context matters and that you're supposed to use questions to frame uh, your mindset, right? To, to put you into the technician mindset to make sure you can frame out what, what it is that you're working through and that you're not approaching it the wrong way. Oftentimes, even just instead of going to someone else for help on a question, even just asking that same exact question to yourself sets your mind that allows you to go looking for the answer. Right? How, as an escalation engineer, it probably happens all the time. Technicians come to you, they ask a question, you go, you already know this answer. Right? And you just, you, how many of you answer a question with a question? I do it. Right? <laughs> and then what do they do? They go figure it out. Right? So even just getting them into the mindset of, of going through and asking themselves first before they go ask somebody else will get them into that into that frame of mind where they can start solving that problem. Uh, I like to compare the troubleshooting method to the scientific method. Uh, so here's the scientific method we all learn in school. I think anyways it's been a long time for me I don't remember but I looked it up online so it's probably right right and then we have the troubleshooting method that I've designed more or less similar phases for that scientific method. It's basically the exact same thing when we have a framework for troubleshooting this is what we should be following. You can take pictures, because I'm not really going to talk about much else on this slide. It's pretty self-evident, although I should check my notes. Um, 
Yeah, let's keep going. All right. <laughs> I learned this lesson way too late in life, by the way. Never do something you can't undo. Uh, I've got stories that I can tell you um, about phone systems, about personal files. I deleted a CEO's hard drive once, uh, their personal desktop, something like, I don't know, 100 gigs of images and stuff like that. Uh, I can go into more detail if we want. Uh, but it was something that, you know, when you make a move, you need to make sure before you make that move, you always have a way out. Identify what can go wrong, what are the possibilities, limit the potential impact of what's going to happen, and design a way to undo it. Right? As you get more experienced, I can tell you, you get sloppier. That's just what happens, or at least it did with me. Um, so hold on, that's too slow, that's too fast. <laughs> Let's go back a second. In, in this case, uh, with the CEO, I was on a Windows 10 machine. And back in the day, when you had a profile that was corrupt, the way to solve the profile, to fix the profile, was to go to registry, rename the registry hive, narrate the folder for the profile reference, rename the folder, log back in, and it loads a new profile. With Windows 10, uh, the Microsoft engineers, in their brilliance, decided to uh, take some of the things that are profile specific outside of the user profile hive and put it in other places. And so now, when, when, in Windows 10, when you go to fix a profile, you can't just do that process. Certain things break when you do. The start, the start menu won't work, search fails, the modern tiles break, all sorts of things go wrong. And the only way to actually reset a profile in Windows 10 and higher is to go to System Properties, pull up the profiles and delete it from there and allow it to rebuild at that point. Now, <laughs> I did this process and I was ready to essentially, re I recreated the user, I was essentially ready to delete the old profile and I opened up system properties and I saw there were two profiles with the exact same name and I didn't know which one was which. In my mind, I made the assumption because I had remembered in past history that it would not let you delete the profile of the account you're logged into. So I was logged in on the good profile with all his files, and I hit the delete button and watched in front of my eyes with my heart sinking as every file on the desktop instantly disappeared. All right, hundreds of gigabytes of photos, documents, and who knows what. And I did not sleep that night because I interrupted the process and then I went to do data recovery. And then the next day, I called up the CEO and I said, Isaac, don't hate me. But if you're missing files, it's my fault. This is what happened. Um, in general, <laughs> when you're doing something, you want to identify something that can go wrong, what can go wrong. Make sure you limit that potential impact, right? I could have easily have made a change to the profile name, understand like which profile is which, and delete the correct one, as opposed to doing that. Uh, he never called me back for his files, by the way, and we had many conversations. It wasn't that he just didn't call me back. He didn't call me back for that specific issue. Uh, so he was fine, and I did get back most of his files. Um, but the last thing is you want to design a way to undo it, right? So that's the problem where experience tricks you up, because you're like, oh, well, I can always undo whatever I mess up. And so then you don't really worry about that too much, like I did. Uh, thankfully, sometimes your experience does come through, and you can undo stuff. Uh, but that's, that's that story. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about going back to mindset. Um, we talked about, let's see if I can find it here. Hold on. Yeah, so even in the situation, so identifying what can go wrong here, right? I'll just bring this back. When we talk about identifying what can go wrong, oftentimes, and especially also designing a way to undo it, Oftentimes, you may not have that experience to back you up, right? So like you're like, well, I mean, I can try, but what if I get it wrong, right? I'm just a level one tech. What can happen? Or I don't really know how to undo it, right? It's just asking the question on what can go wrong will allow you to prepare for things to happen, bad things to happen. You cannot expect everything that's going to happen. You can't account for everything that's going to happen in the future because you don't know what's going to go wrong, right? But even setting yourself in the mindset, if I had expected that everything would get deleted, I would have already been prepared to react immediately, as opposed to having my heart go crazy, adrenaline 
running through me and me trying to like panic fix it, right? If I'm prepared for something to happen, the panic doesn't set in as much and it's easier to work your way out of it. So even just asking the question and considering scenarios, even scenarios that like everyone can think of ways that things can go wrong. That's easy. The hard part is finding ways to fix them. So even if it's a scenario you don't know how to fix, still asking for it prepares you for that situation and helps you with it. Uh, with that being said, we are at the end of the session with 15 minutes or so to go. Tell a telephone story. The tel you want to tell a telephone story? Do you guys want to hear another story of how I messed up way worse than the CEO one? Yeah? Does it make you feel better? <laughs> All right. OK. So uh, I was at a training for a phone system uh, about two to three hours away from uh, the MSP office that I was located in. I was offsite. I was being trained by their uh, distributor because um, we had lost our previous certification technician, and we needed to get someone certified in order to um, to actually continue selling the product. So they sent me out there because I already knew the product. They're like, whatever, it'll be a quick win for you. During the class, we had an uh, open discussion with the instructor, and I had a question about an experience I was seeing on a customer phone system. So I logged into that customer system, and I pulled it up, and I showed them the thing, and I got my answer, and everything was great. Later on, about 15 or so, 20 minutes later, one of the things we're doing as our certification in, our, in the class is to run a lab where we take a demo hardware, we wipe the hardware, and we set it up according to their specifications to make sure that we can pass the test. Right? So they gave us a break to wipe our lab hardware. So we all start off the wipe, and then we walk away. And I come back about 20 minutes, half an hour later, something like that. And I notice that the wipe process is still ongoing with uploading the firmware to the system. And in my head, I'm going, that's weird. Like, the system's right next to it, right? On a one gig network, the file's not that big. It should be done by now. And I'm like, am I even on the right system? Like, this is my mind thinking. Am I even on the right system? I look at the title bar, and it's pointing to the client's PBX address. And in my mind, I'm going, oh, yeah. I, <laughs> it's something that I, I don't think I'd be able to repeat a second time. The amount of adrenaline and how I reacted. Back then, it was before like security postures were a big thing. And I memorized the RDP address and password to log in. I logged into the customer's RDP server and then opened up the phone system from there. And I took a backup of the configuration, the core configuration, and all voicemail messages before the upload finished. It was getting close. It was like 80-something percent. <laughs> before the upload finished, I was able to download the backup of the phone system. I don't know how I thought this clearly to get this done. Okay, With the way this, up, this wipe works, by the way, when you start the upload, you can't stop it. Like It's like, cool, we're wiping. The upload starts up, and then you're done. When the upload finishes, the system reboots, and you're, it wipes it. You're, you're basically dead at that point. Up until the upload finishes, you still have access, and the system's operational. So I'm like fighting the clock here, and I'm fighting the LAN speeds versus WAN speeds, because I'm basically downloading the backup to a local system, which I was able to get the core configuration and voicemail messages off of the system before it rebooted. I got a call from the customer. Hey, Mendy, um, our phones are down. Yeah, really? That's so weird. I'm like, uh, let, me, let me look into that for you. I'm, like, I'm, I'm off-site. I'm at a training, but uh, let me find out. I'll let you know. <laughs> so I go back to the RDP server. I add my additional IP address to log into the, to the phone system uh, phone, on the default IP at this point. And I load up the configuration and the voicemail greeting, uh, messages. And I call him back. I'm like, hey, uh, how are your phones now? It looks like it rebooted. And he's like, yeah, they're up now. OK, great. Have a nice day. <laughs> a week later, he comes back to me. They're like, hey, um, it's so weird. When our phone system outage occurred, like we lost all our voicemail greetings. I'm like, really? What about your messages? Are they all there? He's like, yeah, it's the strangest thing. We have all of our messages, but all of our greetings are like default. I'm like, that's weird. We'll look into it. I would not recommend doing that. Uh, it was much later where I went back to the client and told him what I did. Um, <laughs> but generally speaking, that was early, early days. Uh, always read the screen. Always double check what you're doing. 
question everything you think you know, um, and don't wipe your client's phone systems because, you know, it's not fun. Unless you're fast. Unless you're fast. Yeah, I mean, with today's security and all, you're not doing that again. Like, if I had to go to, like, IT Glue or Hudu, pull up the password, log in to 2FA, and then Duo, and who knows what, like, I would've been, it would've been gone. Anyways, that's the end of the session. We have any questions? There's a microphone in the center, it looks like. Um, if not, thank you for coming. And it was a pleasure being here. Yes? You have to use the mic so it gets recorded. Run. Run. <laughs> Thank you for deleting the phone system. <laughs> uh, so your six logs. Yes. Were those things that you uh, identified kind of afterwards, once you had the time to sleep after your MST, or I guess everything that you just went through, how operation, uh, operationalized was that in your training and mentorship of new staff? Versus were you just kind of doing these things um, and now you've gone back through with more clarity that you have the distance and all that. Um, yeah, let me pull this back up again. So if you missed it the first time, you can take pictures of it again. These are the six laws. Uh, to answer your question, this was not structured in any way, shape, or form. And the most favorite thing someone tells me, it's there's someone who's experienced, reads through, because I have an article on this written up. So they read the article, they come back, they're like, yeah, this is all really good, but you missed like these 25 things. Okay, let me tell you a secret. When you write a process or a policy, and that process or policy is 30 pages long, nobody's reading it, right? Everything that happens through life happens through iterative, iterative improvement. Uh, so that's just a side point. To answer your question, this was not structured in any way, shape, or form. There are, these are the most common things that I would say often during the escalation process or during a training session with a technician. It was not in any framework whatsoever. Um, I was at Rising Tide. I was talking to another guy, and I was explaining to him that he, they were new to being uh, tech, and I was explaining to him the things, and I realized, like, wait a second, I don't know why I'm explaining it now. I can literally just, I have the time to sit down and write it up. Let me go sit down and write it up. And so I did uh, structure it at that point. But up until then, it was not structured. It was just the most common things that I would literally rant about uh, to technicians. Actually rant. <laughs> Actually rant, Kyle says. Any other questions? No? Nope. OK. Thank you. <laughs>